time to time because it's easy for us to forget those basic foundational truths that all the rest of our faith is built upon so that we might indeed have that profitable and wonderful walk with God that we are seeking after. And so I want to do that this evening. The passage of Scripture that Landon read just now is the concluding remarks that Jesus would make as he addressed the seven churches of Asia. And you might remember as you go back there in Revelation chapter 2 and also in chapter 3, as he sent letters to those seven churches, that he, for five of the seven, uh, he had some things, some issues that he had against them, some things that they needed to be aware of and to pay attention to, things that they needed to correct. And there were two churches, though, that he had some good things to say to. One of the churches, he, in looking back over their history, reminded them that they had, they had left their first love. And that certainly is a serious situation indeed. There was another church that he addressed that he said, you know, you have a, you have a reputation for being alive, but you're really dead. And there was that church that, of course, thought that they were rich and affluent and they had no need of anything. And he said, you know, the fact of the matter is you're blind, you're naked, and you're poor. And not only that, but you're lukewarm in your relationship, in your service, in your, uh, in your worship to, to, to God. And he told them, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. And so as we think about those commendations and those reproofs that Jesus made to those seven churches, uh, it reminds us that sometimes we need to be careful that we, that we don't forget some of the, just the first things that we recognize were very, very important to us in the very beginning. And so I want us to this evening go back and look at that statement that Jesus made in the in the passage that was read, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Because it's very important, uh, it's very basic, it's very principle, a, a very uh, basic principle that, uh, that we are looking at, and yet it is one that perhaps there's someone here this evening, or maybe more than just one someone, maybe there are uh, more than one person who needs to give consideration to the fact that Jesus indeed is knocking at the door in the sense that he wants to be your Savior and you have not allowed him to save you, through your, uh, save you from your sins through your obedience to him. And he stands outside knocking, wanting entrance into your heart through your obedience. And you might need to do that this evening so that he can save you from your sins. Maybe there's someone here this evening who has done that. And yet they have, like some of those in those early churches who had grown cold in their love for God and their devotion unto God, we just need to be reminded, I think, from time to time of some very basic things uh, that have to do with our salvation, with our relationship with God. First of all, Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, which obviously indicates that you and I have a, a responsibility uh, in answer to that knock that Jesus is making at the door of our hearts, if you will. First of all, let us consider that it is a knock that is, has to be a deliberate act. Opening the door to Jesus is a deliberate act that each and every one of us must perform in our lives if we are indeed going to be saved from our sins. The door, of course, the separation between us and God has come through sin. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we are well familiar with those passages of Scripture from the book of Romans. And the wages of sin is death, and the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And we're well familiar with those things, but we need to be reminded sometimes, because I think that it's easy for us to go through our daily activities, and time passes, weeks and months, and even years will pass, and we don't go back and, and revisit those, those very basic things that maybe we need to, uh, to revisit from time to time. A couple of weeks ago, uh, maybe a little longer than that, but not too long ago, I presented a lesson uh, that I entitled The Road to Heaven, The Only Worthwhile Road. And we took for the text of that lesson Isaiah chapter 35. 
I'd like to go back to Isaiah chapter 35 and verse 8 and revisit what God had to say there. He said in regard to that heavenly Zion, a highway will be there and a roadway. And it will be called the highway of holiness. But notice what he says next. The unclean will not travel on it, but it will be for him who walks that way and fools will not travel wander on it. Now, I have heard various people refer to that passage of Scripture and uh, make the comment that I, you know, that what God is saying there is, is that even, even fools can stumble on to the truth of God's Word and, and, and be saved. And I don't believe that's what that Scripture is saying at all. I don't believe that it's touching that top side of their bottom, as a matter of fact. I believe that what that scripture is saying is, is that God has provided a way into salvation for all mankind, but you have to be looking for it. That you're not going to stumble on it. That you have to have a good and honest heart and you have to be searching for God. And you have to be looking for redemption of your soul. And you have to be looking for a Savior to come and save you from your sins through your obedience, through the blessed work that God uh, accomplished in sending His Son to the cross of Calvary to be a propitiation for our sins. I believe that that passage of Scripture has to say and has to do with the fact that we need to be searching for God and looking for God and looking for salvation through His Son, Jesus Christ. And that is certainly just as much true to those of us who have obeyed the gospel. I don't care how long you've been a Christian. We have to constantly seek after and search for God in our life. The reason why continual Bible study is so important is because we need to constantly be seeking for the will of God, for a better understanding of the will of God in our lives, so that we can truly be pleasing. We, we must be looking for and we must be ready to make a conscious, very deliberate decision in regard to the fact that God has provided salvation for us in His Son, Jesus Christ. Meredith and I, this last year, enjoyed watching a drama series on television, in which throughout that series, the comment was made, I have no choice here. Uh, and just over and over and over and over again, the star of the show said, I, I had no choice. I have no choice here. I have to do this. Uh, and uh, there is no choice. Well, the fact of the matter is, all of us have a choice. Every one of us have a choice as to whether or not we will allow Jesus to save us from our sins. Every one of us have a choice as to whether or not we're going to take advantage of the fact that God loves us so very much that He gave His Son to die on the cross to save us from our sins so that we might live the hope of eternal life. We have to make a conscious choice to allow Jesus to save us. He extends that marvelous invitation that we read there in Matthew chapter 11. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is life. I think, it, like, I think it's interesting that Jesus' invitation here is, Come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will lift that burden off of you. And we're happy to think about that. We sometimes don't particularly pay a whole lot of attention to the fact that he turns right around then and says that you have to take my yoke upon you. You have to be yoked with me. And he concludes that statement by saying, but my yoke compared to the yoke of sin, compared to the burden and the guiltiness of sin, my yoke is easy and my burden is light in the sense that the burden of Christ, that which he requires of us, eventuates in a heavenly home. But we have to choose to go that way. We have to choose the road that leads to heaven. We have to choose to open the door to Jesus, and it has to be a deliberate act. We don't accidentally become get saved. It's something that we learn about Jesus and about Him being the Son of God and about His, His vicarious suffering on the cross, and we make a conscious decision to obey Him and to commit ourselves to following in his footsteps. Opening the door to Jesus is an individual act. I, I can't obey for anyone, and no one can obey for me. We have to make that decision for ourselves. We're told in Mark 16 and 16, He who believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he who disbelieves shall be condemned. I have to be a believer myself. You have to believe in Jesus Christ yourself. You have to take the information that we have. All of us do. 
We have to take the evidence that God has given us that Jesus Christ is indeed His Son, and that He came to this earth and lived among men, lived a life of perfection, went to the cross and gave His life blood as the propitiation for the sin of the world, the ransom price, if you will, for the sin of the world. And it is through obedience to Jesus Christ that we enjoy the benefits of that sacrifice that He made on the cross of Calvary. But we have to do that individually. I don't care whether my mom and dad are the best Christian on the face of this earth. It doesn't make any difference if my husband or wife is the best Christian on the face of this earth. It makes no difference how godly my family might be. All that has absolutely really nothing to do with the fact that I have to make the choice and I'm the one that has to obey from the heart that form of doctrine that God requires of me. I have to believe that Jesus is the Christ. I'm the one who has to make a commitment to him and follow after him. And that's that's something that we sometimes have some difficulty with because our society really encourages the idea of trying to shove all the responsibility onto <coughs> somebody else. You know, we uh, constantly are hearing people uh, who maybe get in trouble with the law or whatever. Well, it's just a problem <coughs> in this environment, in society. Child, uh, way back in the 1980s, Flip Wilson, a comedian, had a television show in which uh, he constantly was saying, the devil made me do it. And that became a very popular phrase. And, you know, it's just a, it was just a, a line by a comedian, but you would not believe how much impact that that had in people's lives. You had people going around for years and years mimicking how he said it and saying that and would even use that in a certain extent to excuse themselves concerning concerning kinds of behaviors that they knew were not correct and were not right, were not proper, and they'd say, well, the devil made me do it. But that's not the case at all. Just like the devil can't make us do anything, neither will God make us do anything. Our obedience to God, our desire to follow Him, that has to be an individual matter. It has to come from our own heart that we want to bring God glory and honor and do the things that He would have us to do. It's, a, it's a, a, an act that only we as individuals can perform. And then this evening, lastly, and I know that this is kind of a, a brief lesson, but uh, every now and then I just have a lesson, not very often by the way, but every now and then... <laughs> Every now and then I have a, there's just a certain thing I want to say, and that's all I have to say, and I'll just sit down, and tonight's one of those nights, you know? <laughs> and I'm not going to be here Super Bowl Sunday, Tom. I couldn't say this one for, for Super Bowl Sunday. That's when I'm down in Florida holding a gospel meeting down there. That's not very good planning, by the way, to have a gospel <laughs> meeting on Super Bowl Sunday. But also the business of opening the door to Jesus is a very urgent act. And I wish so much that we could... Hope uh, to help the world understand the urgency of giving attention to what God has to say. One of the bad things about Satan's work is that he gets us into this mode wherein we just don't see the urgency of certain things. We don't see the need to do something about our situation right now. And there is an urgency about our salvation. And one of the reasons why I wanted to present this lesson this evening is so that there are some of the young folks in our congregation here that are starting to approach that age to where you, you are paying closer attention to the things that the Word of God tells you. And we need to help our young people understand how important it is that right now, you need to start developing that attitude, the correct attitude toward God, toward obeying God, toward wanting a, and having a genuine desire to please God as opposed to pleasing self. You remember in Acts chapter 24 how that uh, Paul appeared before this man, Felix, and it says there that Felix arrived with Drusilla, his wife, who was a Jewess, and sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus. But as he was discussing righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix became frightened and said, Go away for the present, and when I find time, I will summon you. And of course, you've heard every preacher who has ever read that passage of Scripture follow that by saying that there's no indication that he ever found that convenient time, that proper time 
wherein that he would call for Paul and hear the words that he had to say concerning salvation and obey him. For those of you who are in the hearing of my voice this evening, it's so very urgent that right now, today, if you're not a Christian, that you really need to look into your heart. And you really need to consider, do I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Are you willing to turn in repentance from your sin so that you're not serving self, but you have a willingness to serve God and to do His will? Do you have a conviction that Christ is God's Son to the point that you would be willing to confess Him as God's Son before this assembly? Do you have such faith that would, would, would cause you to be baptized, immersed in water for the remission of your sins? And if you believe in Christ and if you believe that those are the things that God would require of you in order for you to be saved from your sin, do you see the urgency of doing it now. Life is so uncertain. This morning, uh, excuse me, yesterday morning, I woke up and I went upstairs only to learn that Rhett was there. And he's supposed to be on his way over to Virginia. And no one of us, because we had been praying so hard for a safe journey and everything, we really were totally surprised to find him back home. That he had had that accident and that he was not continuing on his journey to Virginia. And that's the way that life is. We just don't know. Have absolutely no idea what the day will bring. And we certainly recognize that there is no promise of tomorrow. That makes today the most urgent time because it's the only time that God has given us for us to work with. We commonly will go over to James chapter uh, or chapter one about uh, or excuse me chapter three about not putting off until tomorrow, but that we pray if it's the Lord's will, we will do this or that tomorrow. Did you know that in the book of Proverbs, do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring forth. And it seems to me that when God tells us anything. He wants us to pay attention to that, but surely when God says something twice, maybe not in the exact same words, but He's saying the same thing, and He's saying it twice. He is bringing or wanting to bring to our attention just how urgent the situation is. Today, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2, is the day of salvation. Today is the day that I have the opportunity to look within my heart, to look at my life, to see what my relationship with God is, and to honestly examine myself, as Paul would write in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5, and to see whether I am in the faith, whether I am in a right relationship with God, and do something about it right now. Because today is the day that we need to take advantage of that. We look at Hebrews chapter 3 and verses 7 8. Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoke me as in the day of trial in the wilderness. God is warning us time and time and time again that if we keep putting things off, the danger of that is it's just so much easier to keep putting things off. My mother and dad, I don't know how many times when I was a child growing up, heard them say, don't put off to Till tomorrow, what can be done today? My mother died just about six weeks short of her 93rd birthday. And in all the days when I was a kid growing up and all the times as an adult that I was there in the house and we would have a meal, in 93 years, and as far as her adult years is concerned, there was only one time that we ever were able to convince my mom to get up from the dinner table and go and do something before she actually washed all the dishes and put them away. Only one time. All the rest of the time we had to wait until Mama did the dishes. I don't know. It was just what she was, the way she was raised. But she was raised that, okay, this is a job that needs to be done. You get it done right now. And then you do something else. Every meal was the same thing. We got through the meal. Mother washed the dishes, somebody dried and put the dishes away before anything else was done. Just one time, <coughs> was there an exception to that? 
And as I think about that, and I think about how important it is as far as our relationship with God, everything else has to be shoved aside. If we would say there's just too much on my plate, then something else needs to be shoved off the plate, but not God, and not doing God's will. The urgency is for us today to obey, to open the door, because it's such an urgent thing that we take care of our soul and make sure that heaven is waiting for us. Can we help you this evening? Can we help you in your obedience to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Can we encourage you? Is there someone this evening that would need to come and ask for the help and the prayers and the encouragement of the congregation? Is there someone here who has Christ knocking at the door and you have yet to open that door to Him? Can we help you in your obedience to Him this evening? And if we can, would you not let us know while we get to the standing center?